All right. We are in Matthew chapter 9, starting in verse 18. There's a lot to cover here, a lot to cover. Uh, for many of you, you've been following right along to the Matthew study, looking into the Word of God. For those of you who are visiting, maybe a first-time visitor today, um, we go through the books of the Bible on Tuesday nights and on Sundays. We just, we just do Bible study here. Uh, we go every verse, every line, every chapter, every book. We just go through the Bible. Uh, I think it's just uh, a blessing to know the Word of God. Uh, people, I, I really believe that the, the will of God for the sons of God is in the Word of God. And I've never been a fan of Bible bingo. Uh, how many of you do Bible bingo? This is Bible bingo. You take your Bible and you go... And that's, your, that's what you're going to read. That's Bible bingo. I've never been a real fan of it. I've always been a fan of just diving in and just, what's in there? What is God talking about? Like, this, your, this is what it's supposed to look like. Okay? And, and it's because you're, you're studying word by word, verse by verse, line by line, what is the Greek definition? What is the Hebrew definition? That's what I believe strengthens a believer. That's how you are able to withstand the storms of life. And then eventually you get your Bible recovered, like I recovered my Bible, with black duct tape. And that's how you live as a Christian. That's how you do it. And so that's what we do here. We go through the books of the Bible. We're in, right now we're in Matthew chapter 9, verse 18, because we left off last week at 17, and we're going to see what God has for us in the Word of God. The will of God for the sons of God is in the Word of God. For those of you who have been here a while, you know that. I, I repeat it constantly just to drive it into your, your beautiful heads. And um, the, the sermon, if you want to title it today. My title today is Jesus, the Compassionate Healer. Jesus, the Compassionate Healer. And we start in verse 9, verse 18 rather, and it says, while he, Jesus, spoke these things to them, behold, a ruler came and worshiped him. A ruler came and worshiped Jesus, saying, my daughter has just died but come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. Okay? Now, Jesus has just done a bunch of miracles. He's got a lot of attention. He's casted out demons. It's just stuff going on. He gets back to where he, his home base is in Capernaum, and he gets out of the boat, and people are, are just, just all around him. People getting healed, demons getting rebuked out of people. Uh, it's just a miracle going on, a lot of excitement. And all of a sudden, we have this, this ruler. It says, a ruler came, a ruler, and worshiped Jesus. A ruler comes to Jesus. You figure a guy in a, with a robe and flip-flops, a robe and flip-flops. That's many of us in Florida in the morning. A robe and flip-flops. And this ruler comes and bows down to the ground and worships Jesus. And says, my daughter has just died. Come and lay your hand on her and she will live. Wow. Now, Luke's gospel has a little bit more information for us. Luke's gospel tells us that the ruler is a ruler of the synagogue. Not just a rabbi in the synagogue, but he's a ruler in the synagogue. He's a head honcho. It tells us that he is, uh, his name is uh, Jairus. And it says in Luke's gospel that he fell down at Jesus' feet. So this is not a parable. This is a true story. This happened one day. Now, what's significant about this is uh, Jairus came face to face with the death of his daughter. 
anyone that has lost a child, only they can know the depth of pain of losing a child. If, if you're a parent and you haven't lost a child yet, you don't know that pain. You don't know how deep that pain is. And here is Jairus. He is desperate. Why? He loves his daughter. He does, he's not ready to let her go. He wants his daughter back in his life. And so Jairus, a ruler of the synagogue, Luke describes it very well, a ruler of the synagogue. He's the head honcho. Now, a ruler of the synagogue in those days was a man of great, great reputation. You didn't become a ruler of a synagogue unless you had a tremendous reputation of being a man of God. Also, a ruler of the synagogue in those days was wealthy. Now, the, we have the destruction of, of, the, of the temple. We have uh, the church scattered. We have uh, the environment is a lot different uh, in, in those days. We have, you know, when Jesus is dying on the cross, we're going to have the, the veil torn and everything and all that stuff. But the, the, the social environment or the political environment of the temple that day, was in, it was in tatters. There was a lot of confusion going on, a lot of political upheaval. And a lot of Jews wanted to get rid of the, the, uh, the, the Romans. Uh, we have Jesus coming on the scene being very popular but this, this scattering of uh, Jews around the, the world at that time had many little synagogues, many, many synagogues. And so Jesus is, is there, and here is Jairus, a leader in the Capernaum synagogue, probably very wealthy, a man of great reputation. And what is Jairus going to risk here? He's going to risk losing his position. He is bowing down to Jesus Christ, who is getting so much attention. And the Pharisees are very suspicious of what's going on with this Jesus movement. And they're not happy with it. And they're trying to find fault with it. And here is Jairus, the head guy. He's risking his prominent position in the community. He's risking losing his wealth. He's li risking losing his reputation. Why? He wants his daughter to live. This is a time that was very unstable in those days. Very, very dangerous time. Jesus now has gotten a lot of attention. And the, the, the Jews are very upset. Things are very unstable. At this time when Jesus was making his move on the popularity of the Christ, at this time when, when Jesus is getting a lot of attention, back in Jerusalem, the political environment is chaotic. Chaotic. There's a, a sect of the Jews that is, uh, really wants to rebel. They want to come against the Roman Empire. They want to get the Romans out of there. It's really unstable. And so this ruler is not someone at that time of history wanting to make waves. But why is he? He loves his daughter and wants her back in his life. That's why. Now, when you think about that, when you think about what in your life would cause you to drop everything, risk everything, and throw your feet at the, throw yourself at the feet of Jesus, what would it be in your life that would cause you to risk it all and throw yourself at the feet of Jesus and cry out for the Lord? You know? Wow. Well, we hope it wouldn't take something like that, right? We surely hope it wouldn't take something like that. But sometimes we're not really willing to fall down at the feet of Jesus until something has really turned the apple cart in our life. 
I know for me, it took the end of me to come to Jesus. It really took the end of me to come to Jesus. I, from, an, from someone looking from the outside in at Pastor Keith, at the time I was just Keith, you would think, hey, that guy's got it going on, man. Surfing every day, owns his own business. Man, I've got, I've got everything happening. I'm sailing to the Bahamas in my own sailboat. I am just living the life. But the Lord was doing something deep in my heart. He was emptying me. Everything, see, what God showed me through that time in my life was I wasn't like Jairus. I didn't lose my son. I lost me. I was done. I lost me. I couldn't find me. And who I was wasn't me. Who I was was me chasing everything to find me. But when I finally came to the end of me, I realized I was never really there. I wasn't there. I, I, you know, there was a void. And what I discovered later on that God has created every human on this earth with a, with a void in their heart. There's this empty spot in every human's life. And he designed it so that only one thing fits in that void. Only one thing. And, and God had this, this square peg in my heart. And I was trying to put circles in it. And I was trying to put hexagons in it. And I was trying to put ovals in it. Nothing would fit in that spot. Only one thing. Jesus Christ. Only Jesus fit in that spot. And I kept trying to find something to fit in that spot. And nothing fulfilled. Nothing. I, I could not find inner contentment. I can find brief times of happiness. You know, hey, when I had a great day surfing and I got that killer wave that I've been waiting for, and man, that was the day, I had a wonderful day. I came home stoked. But see, the next day, I had to still face me. Still had to face me. And all the different things that were going on in my life, all the joys, there were moments of happiness, but there was still that void. I could not fill the spot that emptiness inside. See, when, when the party's over and you go home and you lay on your pillow and you stare at the ceiling, all that's left is you and God. And the problem with laying on your pillow after the party's over is that you're stuck with you. And the problem with being stuck with you is you are the most depressing thing in your life. That's the problem. And now you're stuck with you. Well, I fell on my knees. I mean, literally went to my knees. On my knees. And I didn't even know who God was. I mean, I, w I grew up learning about Jesus. I knew Jesus and Mary and all that stuff. But I went on my knees and I said, Lord... If you are real, if you are truly are real, I need you. I'm empty. I need you. I'm empty. I, have, I don't know where I am, and I don't know who I am. I need you. And I cried real tears, which I hadn't done for many, many years, because I had decided that I wasn't going to let anyone make me cry. And so I cried real tears, pouring out of my eyes, asking God to please come and rescue me. And I got off my knees that morning. And it was a real miracle. Because that whole day, the whole day, I didn't drink beer. And it was a weekend. And I'm on my sailboat. I'm not drinking beer. I'm not smoking anything. I'm not taking anything. The next day, 
I'm not drinking anything, not smoking anything. I knew that something was different. Something was different. I finally had peace in my heart. That I, something was complete. And so what do I do? I'm going to church. I'm going to church. I didn't care what church it was. I really didn't care whose church, what church, what religion. I'm going to church. I'm going to church. And I, we were living in place in the sun. You know what that is? Place in the sun. It's, everyone knows it. Well, back then, it was the biggest party complex in Cocoa Beach. When you drove by it, all you seen was towels and surfboards on every balcony. That was it. And we walked over here to this church, this church, walked in the front doors and sat down. I was home. That day, I was home. I was home. I knew I was home. I felt like I was home. And that finally, I had the right peace in my heart. I had the right peace. I had peace in my heart. Finally, I found Jesus. And why? Because I was willing to let go of everything and I fell at his feet. It didn't matter if I lost every friend I had. It didn't matter I was going to come to Jesus. It didn't matter who was watching me, looking at me, or judging me. It didn't matter. It didn't matter how awful I was in the past. It didn't matter. I knew it was time. And what did it take? It took me dying for me to live. It took, that's what it took. And so the, the death of me is what caused me to come to Jesus. And so Cyrus, Jairus has the same issue. It took the death of his daughter to come to Jesus. And so the question is, what will it take? What will it take to have you fall on your knees and ask Jesus to come and bring life to you? What would it take? It takes willing to let go, willing to risk it all. And I did lose most of my friends. Most of my friends I lost. Most of them. But look at the friends I gained. Not just in this church. I have friends in all of, all, churches all over Rod County. Friends all over the United States and even other countries that are fellow Christians. What did I lose? Nothing compared to what I gained. So that's something you got to ask yourself. So here is Jairus begging Jesus to come heal his daughter. Jesus comes immediately. Verse 19 says, so Jesus arose and followed Jairus. And so did Jesus' disciples. Let's go. Let's go. I can't, can't even imagine Jairus. I mean, he knows that Jesus is performing miracles like crazy. He knows that Jesus is casting out demons. He knows that Jesus can heal his daughter. And there he is on his knees, and then Jesus goes, okay, let's go. Really? <laughs> really? Yeah. Come to my house, Jesus, so that the whole neighborhood can see that I caved. So the whole neighborhood could see that I caved. We have our Christmas decorations out. Do you have your, who got your Christmas decorations out in front of your house? We have our Christmas, you know what they is? There's a sign on, on my lawn that says, Happy Birthday, Jesus. Come to my house. Let my whole neighborhood see who I am. Thank you, Jairus. So here they go. They're on their way to his house. And verse 20 says, and suddenly on their way to Jairus' house to heal his daughter. And suddenly a woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years came from behind and touched the hem of Jesus' garments. 
a woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years. Now, by the way, Jairus' daughter is 12 years old. Luke clues us in on that. So we have a 12-year-old who has lived a joyous, wonderful life in prosperity, notoriety, with a famous dad, with just everything going great for her life, and now she's dead. And then you have a woman who's had a terrible life for 12 years, and she's about to find life. Why? Because we have a compassionate Savior. We have a compassionate Savior. And suddenly the woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years came from behind and touched the hem of Jesus' garment. And Jesus is on his way to, to Jairus' house. She sneaks up from behind and she just goes, For she herself, for she said to herself, if only I may touch his garment, I shall be made well. Why would she say if I could just touch his garment? Because she also has been witnessing the miracles after miracles after miracles after miracles. And she believes, she believes that if she just touches his garment, that the power of his healing will affect her life and she'll be healed. She'll be made well. Verse 22 says, But Jesus turned around and when he saw her, he said, Be of good cheer, daughter. Your faith has made you well. And the woman was made well from that hour. Then Jesus came to the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the noise, noisy crowd wailing. And he said to them, make room for the girl is not dead, but sleeping. And they ridiculed him. But when the crowd was put outside, he went in and took her by the hand. And the girl rose. And the report of this went out into all the land. When Jesus departed from there, two blind men followed him, crying out and saying, Son of David, have mercy on us. And when he had come into the house, the blind men came to him. And Jesus said to them, do, not, do you believe that I am able to do this? They said, yes. Yes, we believe it. Then he touched their eyes saying, According to your faith, let it be to you. And their eyes were opened, and Jesus sternly warned them, saying, See that no one knows this, that I touched your eyes and healed you. But when they departed, they spread the news about him all throughout the whole country. And they went out, and behold, they brought to him a man, mute, demon-possessed. And when the demon, demons were cast out, the mute spoke, and the multitude marveled, saying, it was never seen like this in Israel. But the Pharisees said that he, he cast out demons by the rule of demons. Then when Jesus went about all the city and villages teaching their, in their synagogues, preaching the gospel and the kingdom, and healing every sickness, every disease among the people, but when he saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep among the shepherds. So we, we see this story that Jesus is going to Jairus' house to heal his daughter, and the woman comes up and touches him. What is Jairus thinking? Dude, I thought we were going to my house. Right? <laughs> Dude, my house? Remember my house? Wow. Um, Luke's gospel 
I like Luke's gospel because it really goes into detail. When Jesus, when the woman touches Jesus, Jesus says, who touched me? He felt his power released out of him. He said, who touched me? And his disciples say, what are you talking about? We're surrounded by people. There's a multitude around us. You're being thronged by everyone, pushing and shoving. And, and you say, who touched you? He goes, yeah, somebody touched me. Who touched me? And the woman comes and says, I touched you. And it says that she, she told him in front of all these people, he told, she told him all that she's been through. 12 years of doctors, and no one could heal her. All her money spent, no one could heal her. All the things she went through, no one can heal her. A flow of blood. This is really a tragic situation. And it wasn't like it is today where you could just go to uh, the store and pick up feminine, feminine products. You, you know, you're going through a lot of cloth and a lot of stuff. And it's a hazard, and it's it's it's. Not a good situation. And not only that, you're not allowed to go to the temple because you're considered unclean in, the, in that day. And so this woman has been struggling for 12 years. And she's, it's, it says that she told everybody in front of Jesus her issue. Again, right? What would it take for you to push through the crowd to come to Jesus? What would it take for you to be totally exposed to come to Jesus? Sometimes, sometimes you just got to give it up and say, you know what? I need you, Lord. And it doesn't matter if I got to push through the crowd. It doesn't matter if I got to just come close to you. But I need you, Jesus. It doesn't matter that you call me out. I need you, Jesus. You know, when we ask people in our church, does anyone want to receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior? Does anyone really feel like God is speaking to you and wants, and you want God to forgive your, your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness, reserve your place in heaven to fill you with the Holy Spirit? We ask you, if there's anyone here that wants that, we say, please come forward. Please come forward. Now, that's, that's scary. I'm going to get up in front of all these people, and I'm going to come forward? This woman got up and came forward in front of her community that was not sure about Jesus. You're in church where everyone's sure about Jesus. Everyone's on Jesus' side. Everyone's cheering you on. If it's hard to do it here, it could be near impossible to do it anywhere else. But the Bible says, if you confess me before man, I will confess you before the Father. And he said, if you deny me before man, I'll deny you before the Father. So Christ wants you to say, I don't care what it costs. I'm coming to Jesus. I don't care what I lose. I'm coming to Jesus. I don't care who's watching. I'm coming to Jesus. I don't care what crowd I got to push through. I'm coming to Jesus. I don't care. I'm coming to Jesus. I need Jesus now, right now. I need Jesus. That's where they're at. That's where they're at. And so Jesus is... And Jairus is like, hey, I thought we were going to my house, my house. Yeah, we're going to get there. Well, I got some blind guys to heal first. Blind guys? Come on, blind guys. I got a dead daughter. <laughs> yeah, we'll get there. We got the blind guy to take care of. Fine, blind guy, fine. Wait, we got to cast out some demons too. Demons? Come on, my house, my house. <laughs> Verse 23, when, the, when Jesus came into the ruler's house, finally, 
Finally, he saw a flute player and a noisy crowd wailing. Jesus comes into the house. Why is he seeing a flute player and a noisy crowd? Well, it's because Jairus is wealthy. And in that culture, if you're a Jew and you're wealthy, you hire mourners, professional mourners. And if you're really wealthy, see, if you're poor, you might be able to hire maybe one or two wailers. And they would come and you'd, you'd actually pay them to cry over the dead and wail, like, Mah! like really wail. And so Jairus is rich, so you have a flute player, flute players, and you have crowd of mourners. So there could be like 15, 30, maybe 50 mourners. And they're all in the house just wailing away. And Jesus comes into the house, and he's like, is this a funeral or a party? What's going on here? Then Jesus came into the house and saw the flute players, flute players, they got a whole band, and noisy, a noisy crowd wailing. He said to them, make room for the girl is not dead, but sleeping. And they ridiculed him. They made fun of him. They laughed at him. So they went from, from wailing to laughing. And so if you're, you're the hired wailers and the hired flute players, and so a guy comes in with a robe and flip-flops, and he says, hey, just want to let you guys know she's not dead. What would you do? An uproar of laughter. Ah! <laughs> beating each other on the back. Ah, that guy's a crazy nut. Right? That's what you do. That's reality. This took place. This really happened. So the, when the crowd was put outside, he get, made him leave. Get out of here. He went in and took her, Jairus' daughter, by the hand, and she arose. She came back to life. Now, their mourning and wailing, Jairus had to go to find Jesus, let him know what's going on. My daughter's dead. They had to go through the whole thing of like the woman with the issue of blood. You got all this other stuff going on. So by the time they get there, she's been dead a while. She's been dead a while, meaning that she's dead, dead. She's dead. And she arose. She's alive. And that would explain verse 26. And the report of this went out into all the land. So Jesus now has got a lot of attention. Performing miracles, casting out demons, letting the blind see, and raising the dead. He's getting a lot of attention. And what the attention he's getting is scaring the leaders. It's scaring the leaders to have one of their own leaders bowing down at Jesus' feet and having one of their own leaders' daughter healed. They're having a tough time. Now, the woman with the issue of blood is another I issue because... Um, She's unclean. Jesus should have no business being near her or talking to her. But he is. So you see a lot of things that, are, that the Jewish leaders are having a problem with here. Things are not going well. So he goes out. He does some more healing. Heals the two blind men, casting out demons. And it's, we get to the end of uh, chapter 9. 
Then he said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful. Harvest is truly plentiful. The harvest today is plentiful. The harvest today is plentiful. When you think of, let's just say there's, there's 12,000 people in Cocoa Beach. 12,000. Do you think there's 12,000 people in church today? No. Why? They haven't been harvested yet. They need to be harvested. But the problem is the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out harvesters into the harvest. 12,000 people live in Cocoa Beach. Just Cocoa Beach, not Cape Canaveral, Mer uh, Tid Titusville, or Melbourne, or Satellite Beach. Just Cocoa Beach, 12,000 people. There's no way there's 12,000 people in church today. That means there's harvesting, harvesting to do. Now, we're going back here. Um, To verse 20, 36, when it says, But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. There are thousands of people in Cocoa Beach that are scattered like sheep and have no shepherd. But what will it take for this small group of people to reach Cocoa Beach, Cape Canaveral, Satellite Beach. What would it take? It would take us being moved with compassion. That's what it would take. But when Jesus saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were, they were weary and scattered like sheep with no shepherd. Verse 37 again, then Jesus said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. Wow. Do we have a mandate? Do we have a, do we have a call of charge from the Lord? Yes, he said, go ye therefore into all the world, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's us. We are to go, therefore. Go, therefore. Does it move a little? Does it move you a little bit, just a tiny bit? Does it move you to the thought of maybe I should be more useful for the kingdom? Maybe I should be more useful for the kingdom. Maybe a little bit more. Maybe, maybe just a tiny bit more useful for the kingdom. I'll never forget the day I laid on my face right there. Laid flat on my face. Not on my knees. Laid right there on the carpet. I'll never forget that day. I laid there and I said, Lord, please give me a burden for the lost. I wasn't a pastor. I wasn't a preacher. I wasn't even a Sunday school teacher. I was just young in the Lord. But I remember it clear as a day. I laid on that carpet right there and I said, Lord, give me a burden for the lost. Jesus was moved with compassion for the lost. He moved with compassion for the lost. So that's it. Pray for the Lord, the Lord of the harvest. You pray, Lord, give me a burden for the lost. Let me have the compassion you have. Can you do that? Can you do that? Well, before we close, I'll ask two questions. The first question is, are you finally ready to come to the end of you to begin the beginning of you? Are you willing to come to the Lord this morning and surrender your life to him and settle it once and for all? Surrender your life to Jesus. Just today, let today be the day. I just surrender. Lord, it's the end of me. And it's the beginning of you. 
And if that's you today, if you've never made that firm commitment, that firm decision for the Lord in front of all these people, would you come forward right now and receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Could you do that right now? Just stand to your feet and walk right up here, and I'll pray with you. Amen. 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 Anyone else? Anyone else? This is your day. This could be your spiritual birthday. Come to the end of you. Is there anyone else? Praise God. Praise God. This is a very, very, very wonderful day for you. Wonderful day for you. Wow. Is there anyone else? This is very important. This is just, this isn't some church thing. This is really important. This is God calling you today. This is the Lord Jesus himself calling you to say, come to me. Risk it all and come to me. Is there anyone else? I'm going to ask for another question. I said two questions. What's first question? Second question is this. If you have been following the Lord and you are saved, but you feel like you need to make a fresh beginning, that today you need to renew your faith to the Lord. Today you need to surrender. Just give it up and make a new fresh beginning today. If that's you, come forward. New beginnings. Who else needs a new beginning? Brand new beginning today. Anyone else ready to start all over? Brand new, fresh start. Not that you're getting saved again. You're already saved, but you need a fresh start. Anyone else? I don't want to leave you out. If God's talking to you, just get up. Doesn't matter who's looking. Amen. Mm. Wow, look at all you guys. I was just good kidding. Sit down. No. <laughs> Isn't this beautiful? That when God speaks to our hearts, when he touches us, we just, we move. We respond. Isn't that beautiful? So whether you're making this decision for the first time in your life, giving your life to Jesus, right now, we're all a family because God's already got your heart. He's already got your attention. So this is the family of God. Amen? Amen. 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 Would you all stand and pray with me? Lord God, we sure do love you, and we sure do love this family. And we love your word, how it touches us and it moves us, Lord, closer to you. And Father, for these decisions, Lord, for those who are making this decision for the first time, I ask that you wash them whiter than snow, and remove all their sins, cast them as far as the east is from the west, fill them with the Holy Spirit, give them the power to live this Christian life. Lord, just thank you that you have their reservation in heaven already prepared for them. And Lord, for the rest of us, Lord, as we make these commitments to, to start over, to let the past be behind us and move into the future, Lord, fill us anew, afresh, give us a powerful zeal and excitement to serve you and to make you known, Lord God. Thank you for this day and thank you for moving in us today. We love you, we bless you, and we praise you, Lord. And we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Amen.